So, you know, these are, are things that I look at, not just to say uh, to doctors across the country, consider this disease in the context of your community, but also for my doctors here and for, uh, for myself and my patients and my family, right? Um, something that Joe keyed into from a conversation we had before, which was none of my patients were riding a bicycle before they ended up on a ventilator in the ICU. And you asked me that again, Joe, you said, well, you know, <laughs> is that still the case? The answer is yes. I still haven't had a healthy person uh, come in and, and go on a ventilator. It doesn't mean it won't happen. Uh, it doesn't mean it can't happen, but I can tell you that it hasn't happened in, in Northern, uh, you know, North County here. And the reason for that is because we're, we're in the best place to go through COVID, warm, sunny San Diego with a, a spread out population. And so, you know, there are kind of advantages to living in San Diego and the fact that our taxes are so high. <laughs> All right. So we kind of want to get into the idea of, you know, relaunching school. And there were some questions from our last conversation with our parents um, last Thursday around masks specifically. And yeah. there was this interesting study that you were talking about with guinea pigs. Can you tell yeah. us more about guinea pigs and masks? That sounds like an interesting combination. <laughs> so, and you know, and let me just say, I'm not an expert in whether or not it's the right time to reopen a school and, and what schools should do or anything like that, right? The only time I find myself in schools is, is uh, when I'm either, they're given to talk about, you know, being a doctor and trying to inspire little kids, which happens sometimes, or actually dropping my mind off. Uh, so it's not like I really understand what a, what a school should do, but I do understand masks. And my my understanding of, of masks is, uh, well, the guinea pig study you asked about, right? So somebody actually took coronavirus, which guinea pigs can get, and put a bunch of them in a bunch of cages close by each other. Uh, and some of them had masks on the outside going out. So infected uh, little guinea pigs had a mask protecting the other guinea pigs, uh, uninfected. Some of them had masks, some of them didn't. And they had all these guinea pigs just basically hang out in a room together for a couple of days. And what they found was having a mask on the sick guinea pig actually decreased infections the most. So as I'm talking to you right now, I'm literally spraying out all this. Every time I, I say a consonant, I obstruct the airflow in my mouth. And it's a wet surface, which means that a little droplet launches into the air. And, you know, right now it's hitting my computer screen. I'm not even aware of it. But the fact is, whenever I'm talking, th something's coming out of my mouth. Um, but I told you, Joe, about how I had Brody and I, we sat down and, and, uh, and he had some ice cream that we got from a, a blue popsicle. And I was trying to explain this concept to him about why he needs to wear a mask and why we want people wearing masks when we go out, because he at first had a hard time with it. And we just put a white piece of paper down between us and he got to eat the entire popsicle and just talk to me. And we just talked. And, you know, he wasn't shouting. Every once in a while, he'd get excited and say something because that's just the nature of a four-year-old. But uh, at the end of our conversation, we picked up the paper and inspected it. And sure enough, there's little blue droplets on this piece of paper. So, uh, and that's, I basically said, look, if you had coronavirus, that would be what I would be worried about getting. You can imagine if you had a mask on, none of that would have come out. With the guinea pigs, it's, it's not completely protective, but it decreased infections the most to have a guinea pig wearing a mask. The second thing was you could decrease about half of the infections by having a guinea pig wearing a mask that was not infected. And, and the idea there is that, um, you know, these little droplets, they hang in the air for a little bit. I don't know how long, it depends on the temperature, the humidity, um, how just how much the person was talking when they shot out that particle, right? Singing is, probably the worst thing you could do in terms of shouting or being in a crowded bar shouting at people. Uh, so, the, you know, two things I would not do right now would be choir practice or going to a noisy bar because <laughs> I'd be worried about people spewing everything out. Um, but anyway, so putting the mask on the guinea pig uh, prevents them from inhaling that little droplet that's, that's hanging in the air. So, uh, you know, my take on masks is uh, there's probably part of the reason that Asia did not get hit as hard as we did is it's already in their culture to go to school, uh, walk around, ride a bus, wearing a mask, et cetera. Um, I kind of don't like it. Like I really hate it. And I, and I wear masks all the time and, and I'm comfortable with them. I don't like the lack of facial expressions. I don't like um, not knowing, you know, uh, sometimes some people say like, I didn't realize how hard of hearing I was until I can't see anybody's mouth anymore. 
Like it really, I, I just hate masks. Uh, but the reality is until we have a vaccine, uh, you know, I think I'll be wearing a mask and, uh, and I'll be asking my wife to wear a mask when we go out in public. And, um, you know, it's just, it's not, I don't think that getting the virus would be that big of a deal for me. It could knock me off my feet. I don't know. But why take a chance if the alternative is I'm going to wear a mask for the next six months? And, and so that's kind of where we're at with it. The piece that we were chatting about as well is that like the intensity of the infection um, and you, you talked a little bit about, you know, we probably from our own immune system is pretty strong, especially robust people who are riding a bike and doing that thing. Yep. But it's the, that's being in that, that COVID space over multiple sessions. And you notice that with doctors who are in yeah. that intensity space. So kind of, it's that, that's probably the piece that we have to kind of figure out is that give and take around exposure. Yeah. Yeah, so so I uh, I am in contact, in direct contact with people who have COVID, and uh, and that's you know I have to be I I touch them I take care of them, and uh, you know I do high risk procedures for them. So as you can imagine, I really think a lot about the virus and protecting myself, my doctors, my nurses, and uh, and so uh, you know what I've what I've read is when doctors get sick, the severity of their illness directly correlates with two things, the number of patients that they saw, as well as the, uh, the number amount of time that they spent caring for patients. So in other words, the amount of virus that you're exposed to directly correlates with the severity of your illness. If one person walking by you coughs and it's in the air, it gets in your mouth, that might actually be a blessing. You might actually get a really light version of the disease, build up some immunity to it, and go about your merry way with nothing more than, you know, a, a slight cough and, a, and a, a fever or something like that. If you're on a crowded subway and five people cough in the air and there's there's no ventilation in that subway system, you're going to get it. And New York uh, showed us that. And you're not just going to get it a little bit. You're going to get it going to get it seriously. Um, you know that whole thing about people not riding a bike. That's San Diego. That's not the case in Chicago. That's not the case in New York. In those places healthy people got it because no matter how healthy you are, you get in a subway car with a bunch of people that are, that are all infected with this pathogen, you're going to get it. And, and the amount that you're exposed to directly correlates with the severity of your illness. Um, this is pretty much widely accepted and, and well-documented, but I don't know, you know, these, these are kind of my opinions, right? There's, there's, I don't think this has actually been tested to see exactly how much, you know, you get and, and that sort of thing. But, you know, so for myself, uh, for example, the doctors, right? At the hospital, we don't have a single doctor running the COVID service, right? Going and seeing everybody. We spread it out. So we have five doctors going and seeing all those patients so that each person is only getting exposed just a little bit. Uh, those kinds of things tell you that doctors know the amount of, of pathogen correlates with the severity. And, kind of like uh, a radiation, right? They have those radiation yeah, gauges. Sure. Bigger it is, almost. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and nothing's universal, right? Like, you know, one exposure could certainly knock somebody off their feet and they could be healthy, but that's generally not happening. Well, uh, that kind so of just circle that. back then to your own kiddo, preschooler, and wearing masks and washing hands. And it's kind of a practice now that we need to maybe train up our kids because there's this energy around, you know, uh, not wanting to kind of change and the facial expressions and the experience, but you're saying that it clearly makes a difference, the mask specifically. And what should we do with kids? Like, you know, that's an all day change. It's not like we're getting on a plane and we have to take off our shoes, the inconvenience. This is an all day experience if we were to be back at school. So talk to us about that and your own kid. Mike, yeah. Um, so when, when Brody plays with another child, I don't ask him to wear a mask, one kid, right? Uh, when we go into public, we do. And similarly with myself, when I'm hanging out with a friend, I'm not like wearing a mask uh, you know, certain things have changed. Like I, I don't, uh, you know, maybe I'm more conscientious about not shouting at somebody directly in their face. Like maybe I kind of, maybe there's a little bit more distance between us, but if it's kind of one person, I'm, I'm, I'm not asking my kid wear a mask all the time with all contact, you know, avoid everybody at all costs. So I, I don't know. Is it, that's just not, not what I think needs to be done. Um, but if you said to me, um, putting him in a situation where it's a bunch of kids, then I'd be asking him to wear a mask. And or a bunch of people like going to the grocery store. 
right now we kind of even minimize that, right? I, I had to go pick up something at the auto parts store today, Home Depot the other day. And those are places that I used to always take him. And it was like a fun thing to do. And, and right now we're just not doing that. And there are kids out there and I don't judge parents for doing it at all. Uh, but, uh, but I tend not to, to do that. And I'm getting to a spot where maybe we will be. Um, mask wearing for him has been a tough thing. I think that, uh, that explaining it to him, that, man, my kid knows so much about coronavirus. <laughs> you can imagine, right? That's what he gets for his bedtime stories. Uh, but, um, you know, by the way, I don't know if I shared this with you guys. There's a book. If you just Google uh, coronavirus book, and, and Joe, I'll get you the link to it, coronavirus book for kids. There is an ebook about coronavirus, and we've read through that as well. It shows pictures. It kind of explains why we wash our hands and that sort of thing. If anybody's into Curious George, there's a Curious George discovers germs. That's another good one. Uh, and uh, and then the, the little experiment that he loved to do, which was eat a popsicle over a piece of, of uh, white paper, you know, those are things that kind of just, I think that he needed to understand that when we talk, little particles come out of our mouth. And most of us don't, you know, we kind of suppress that because we don't like the idea that we're constantly walking around spitting on each other, right? but we are. And so uh, to show that to him, I think helped in terms of getting him to buy into wearing the mask. And yes, he hates it. Yes, it's hot. Yes, he pulls it down sometimes. But, uh, but he's certainly much more willing to wear it now, I think, after kind of going through those things. Yes, that's good. There was another question earlier from our previous conversation around kids getting exposure and then, you know, getting sick. I mean, you were telling me that all viruses do that in a way, that you yeah, get so some type of infection. About, yeah. yeah, the kids- I Remember what that was called, that particular syndrome. Or Kawasaki disease. syndrome, yeah. So, so Kawasaki syndrome is basically this inflammation of your heart and- it's almost like a heart attack for kids. Uh, it can be fatal and it can be really bad. Uh, as, as far as I know, it's, there has not been um, many cases outside of severely infected areas. So remember that whole thing about the dose? You know, if, if the, the cases coming out of New York and these bigger cities, uh, those are probably kids that got exposed in either in their household or out in public prior to, you know, a lot of the social distancing stuff or whatever and they probably got large inoculums. That being said, this is not really a disease that, that uh, harms children that much. And so I really look at, at my kids as a vector of transmission, not as people that are at risk. And you know, realize I come home, right? I, I literally hang out with people who have this, this virus and I come home and I have to make a decision about, am I gonna hug my kid or not? And Early on, I wasn't. Early on, I was, I was, you know, trying to to get out of the house before they were awake and get back in after they went to bed and not see them for like the week that I was on, and uh, and then you know now I think as we've learned more about the disease and and I've seen it not killing a bunch of kids and a lot of kids not getting infected and that sort of thing, um, you know, I for me I've kind of gotten much more relaxed. I take a shower now when I come home from the hospital, which I didn't used to do every time. And I don't hug my family until I've had that shower, but, um, but sure. And I change my clothes and leave them in the, in the garage. And I think most docs and nurses are doing that these days, but I'm not as worried about giving it to them. And, uh, and so, and again, I'm not telling people to, to, you know, expose your kid to it, but it's kind of one of those things where I'm just not as worried about it. If I had uh, a, a, one thing I, I understand, I, my neighbor, who's like a good friend of mine, his parents live in his house with him and so he does really isolate this kid a little bit more, you know, and his kid has, it, and I get that because uh, he doesn't want the virus coming home. In my house, there's nobody that's going to get hurt from it. Uh, but in, in a house, if you have elderly people, I get that. Um, and so I think everyone has to kind of have their own approach to this based on, on their sense. situation. Yeah, it's maybe a good time to talk a little bit about vaccines and maybe a little history about vaccines themselves that we actually used to put real cultures in people, right? <laughs> and, and that's the idea. We don't really do that anymore. That probably doesn't go over very well, but that's right. that was the reality of a vaccine, right? And maybe right. the trajectory you see on that, Dr. Butler's version of that, and maybe the seasonality of the virus that you might think about as well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so uh, Salk, right? Uh, the Salk Institute's right here in town. And, uh, and that guy injected himself with a, a, a live, but, uh, but you know, what we call attenuated 
version of the vaccine because it was going to just be too impossible to get FDA clearance to inject live vaccine viruses into people. And uh, you know, I believe he got a Nobel Prize for it. Uh, he certainly gave us vaccines. Nowadays, we're not doing that as much, but but the point is, a small dose your body can handle of almost everything. You know, there's certain things that I would not take a chance on, like Ebola. But uh, but th but with this coronavirus, if you said to me, uh, we can give you a very very small inoculum of it, Ian, you're going on vacation for for four weeks. You're going to be able to get sick, get back to work. Because uh, we don't need you for four weeks at the hospital, would you take a small dose of it? You know, I personally would actually take that. And uh, and again, I'm not telling people to go out and get infected, but if I knew that I could do it in a way that didn't impact my life at all, where I could isolate myself and go through it, I probably would do the the sulk version of, of getting the virus. You know, um, none of my docs are doing that. We're not going around trying to get the virus. Trust me. Uh, but uh, you know, the uh, the reality is. Uh, a small amount of this virus is actually not that scary to me. And I can tell you it was, um, man, uh, March 31st, I think was, I think it was March 31st that uh, I really just, I just remember feeling some serious like fear, you know, about this. I had a guy, I don't know if, if, uh, if, any, if, uh, if anybody's on Instagram, look at my, I've got this Instagram, you know, page where I pretty much just have pictures of my Jeep and, and the boys out camping and stuff like that. It's Doc Wrangler. Um, but uh, like regular, like a Jeep, the, the, there's a day where I posted a picture of me wearing like a complete hazmat suit. And I put on this complete hazmat suit and held up a sign like stay at home or something. And, and that day, I think it was March 31st, uh, I was going into to, to uh, you know, put a guy on a, on a machine, on a ventilator. And, and I just remember getting that dressed up and, and just, just, you know, being really kind of afraid of this whole thing. And now, you know, March, April, May, two months later, uh, well, actually April, May, so so six, eight weeks later, um, I think that we've kind of had enough experience where we've seen a lot of people get better. Uh, a lot of people in San Diego specifically get better. We've learned um, this is not New York. This is not the problem they had in New York. It's a very different reason why uh, things have gotten out of control in other parts of the country. But, um, you know, we're pretty well prepared here in San Diego. We've been really lucky and we also just live in the best place to go through it. Yeah, and you notice that there are actual some drugs that actually do make a difference. Um, right, yeah, we that have actually that. <laughs> Yeah, that actually, yeah. not a hindrance. Yeah, um, and there's been a lot, of, a lot yeah. of media about that. Yeah, uh, yeah, we, maybe season, yeah. Yeah, seasonality of the virus, you see that coming and going like, like the regular flu. And yep. then you were talking a little bit about children as vectors of transmission. And yeah. maybe speak a little bit more about that. Like if you have grandparents or pre-existing conditions at home and kids are coming back to school, maybe kind of talk us through that in the context of school. And so vectors of transmission and um, seasonality. Yeah, so so as far as the, the uh, seasonality goes, I expect that just like the flu, uh, the rest of the country, not San Diego, the rest of the country is gonna be indoors, spending more time in close proximity to each other passing around influenza, and they're probably gonna be passing around coronavirus. It's not gonna be as bad as this first time because there's gonna be a lot of people, 30% of New Yorkers, right, have been exposed to this. And so it's not gonna be as bad. Uh, maybe by January, February, we might actually have a vaccine. I'm, I'm, a, I'm like a, an optimist and I think we will. Uh, because I think, you know, you shave a trillion dollars off the stock market and uh, people pay attention. And so there's a lot of money going into trying to develop a cure for this way more money than ever went into any vaccine, you know, in history. Uh, and, and I think what's happened is we've kind of not just this, I think we're learning so much that uh, another virus pops out a year from now, we're going to handle it a lot better. Uh, so, so all that I, I can tell you, I, I know health systems have learned a ton. And uh, is, so the seasonality, yeah, it's going to happen. The flu is going to come back. Coronavirus is going to come back. Uh, just like uh, the flu and, and, uh, and the way that it hit San Diego, we're going to peak probably uh, a little bit later than the rest of the country. The rest of the country is going to get it and then they're going to give it to us. And, uh, you know, we'll end up with uh, a February, March timeline probably of having a little bit of a resurgence, you know, of, uh, of coronavirus here. These are, by the way, I'm totally making this stuff up, right? This is, this is my, my view of the world. Who knows what's going to happen? And, uh, you know, as, as far as the, um, the, the kids being the vector of disease. Yeah. You know, it's, I'm not that worried about Brody getting it. I'm more worried about him giving it to somebody. 
And, uh, and so him getting it, uh, having symptoms, not having symptoms doesn't even matter. He's a kid, he touches stuff, he's gonna, he spreads it, kids spread stuff. And, uh, and so, you know, uh, if I had elderly people in my house, I would probably be handling things different, either isolating him more or isolating them more, I don't know. Uh, I can tell you that uh, I was on a call today with doctors and uh, you know, one of my docs is, uh, his wife is going through chemo and he is literally sleeping in a tent in their backyard. And uh, I can tell you that I was, if I got, if I had symptoms, if I get a fever, um, I'm also going to be sleeping in a tent. So it's not like, uh, you know, I'm completely cavalier about passing it off to my family. Um, but, uh, you know, if there's, so my worry about kids would be that they could transmit it if I had, you know, at risk people in my house and uh, at risk being people with uncontrolled medical problems, uh, going through chemo, uh, elderly, you know, those sorts of things. And, and I, I kind of, I would even add that, and again, I'm just making this up, but I would extend that at risk population to, um, to small babies, I think. And I don't know what the age cutoff is there. I've got a doc who just had a baby, like literally just had a baby in April. And, uh, you know, he isolates himself from the baby uh, when he's been working, you know, we basically mm -hmm. try to group our shifts together. And so, you know, again, I, like, I don't want to freak anybody out that's got a baby, but I probably would just be a little bit more cautious if I had one in the house, but I don't. So, you know, I'm yeah. less, oh, less worried about it. Yeah. yeah. You know, trying to put in the, the right precautions to allow people to come back in time for school, um, yeah. be it, you know, partially, you know, half the kids or not. Um, but this idea that, you know, maybe temperature checks and wearing masks, could we get a false sense of security doing temperature checks and thinking that maybe 48 hours before that, before that there was zero symptoms and zero fever? Is that a reality? Or yeah, definitely. We... You know, so the temperature check thing is, again, I'm, I'm saying something that probably doesn't jive with most people's official policy, but the temperature check is, is not picking up many folks. You know, I asked, because uh, we do temperature checks at the hospital, and at least 10 times I've asked the people doing the check, catch any fevers today? The answer is always nope. And, and the other thing is, if it's morning time, we're all walking in from a, a cool outdoors and they're always like, oh, your temp is uh, 90 degrees. Like, no, probably not, but I'll take the pass. So, um, you know, it's, it, so never mind the fact that people can be asymptomatic carriers and that you can transmit this prior to having that big fever. Uh, the temperature check, while a lot of people are gonna do it, fine. Uh, and maybe you'll pick up some one in a thousand, but it's probably not going to be that protective. Um, yeah. you know, mask wearing, I think is going to be a helpful thing and, and makes sense to me. Um, you know, I don't know, it, you know, I think we can do a lot for, for kind of decreasing. So when I say isolation, I, I don't mean isolating yourself from an individual or your friend set, right? To me, social isolation means isolating yourself from large groups of people or, uh, or fast moving, spreading people, right? So if you said to me, we're going to take your kids and they're going to come into a classroom and they're only going to hang out with their classroom and we're not going to have a big joint lunchtime where everyone eats in the cafeteria together. I would say, yeah, that makes sense to me. Uh, if you said to me, we're going to, uh, you know, um, even cut the class size down in half uh, and have kids come every other day or something like that. So, okay, that kind of makes sense too. I'm not advocating for that. I don't know what the right thing is, but you know those kinds of things where you're basically you're kind of decreasing the number. But I don't think we have to so completely isolate folks. You know, it's more about decreasing the size of your of your cohort that you're kind of going through life with. And if you can just decrease the number of people you're coming in contact with, and when you are contacting a bunch of strangers, you know, have that mask and wash those hands. You know, then then I think we can decrease the spread. And the other thing is, you know, just remember, man this whole thing is going to be over. We are going to find uh, a vaccine to this, right? The flu, don't downplay the flu. The flu killed hundreds of millions of people before we had a vaccine. And, you know, people say, oh, you know, people, you know, don't, don't compare a coronavirus to the flu. Like, well, actually the flu is really bad. The difference is we have a vaccine and we have treatment. And so, uh, you know, the, the flu in itself has been a very, used to be a really big deal. And so similarly, you know, I have complete confidence that we're going to fix this one too. And the flu mutate changes and the vaccine doesn't always work. And, and you know, 50, 60,000 people die every year from it. It's not a joke. 
Um, but, um, you know, and I, my practice changes, like my ICU changes every winter because of the flu. And that's going to happen now with coronavirus too. But uh, we're going to get back to a place where we're comfortable walking around because we have the vaccine and there's going to be much less of this. Uh, so whatever it is, like that, that's kind of yeah. what I remind myself. Just like, don't freak out. It's, this is, this is not forever. This is, this is until some time period next year, you know, and, and we're going to. And there's some things that we should be taking into account. Like you said, using masks and not, not singing at each other. Yeah. Directly. <laughs> don't Maybe in your car. Practice. <laughs> I, I, I think think everyone heard about the choir practice, right? Up in Washington. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What, what uh, maybe last bit, and we'll use the backside of our conversation here with our family and friends to uh, use as questions and answers. We can actually see the future. Yeah. That's what I heard. We can yeah. see the future. It might be just two months, but hey, talk to me more about this idea of seeing the future. Yeah. So, you know, I was, uh, I was brainstorming with um, some uh, retired docs and also docs that are, that are in kind of different positions as well as some technology people. And, uh, and trying to predict uh, the future, right? Because we've, um, you know, my, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be a part of like this, this really large group of physicians and we need to know as best possible what's gonna happen. And so we spend time sitting around thinking about it. And one thing that, uh, that I, we just kind of, we realized as a group, I guess, is we don't need to predict the future. We just need to go find it because there are places that are actually two months ahead of us or three months ahead of us. And we can find places that have reopened their schools, for example, in Asia, and we can see how they did it. And we can look and see what worked and what didn't work, right? Japan reopens their schools. All the kids wear masks, they're okay. Korea reopens them, nobody wears a mask. They're, now they're all in trouble, right? That would be the sort of thing that I would go out and try to predict. Uh, you guys don't have to figure this out right now, because I think it's still May, right? I don't know when you have to make a determination uh, as, as, you know, principal and, you know, power unified and how that all goes down. But uh, there, you know, every two weeks that goes by, we learn more and more about this disease. And also we get to see other parts of the world that have been through it ahead of us and see what works and what doesn't work. And so, you know, if, if school returns in, you know, August or whatever, and, uh, and, we look and we see, you know what? Uh, s countries reopen their schools exactly like they always did and they were fine. I would look at that and say, I'm reassured. Okay, yeah, I, I actually would be down with that plan. And uh, if we looked and said, countries reopened with precautions and they were fine, I'd say, okay, let's do that too, you know? Uh, so that's, that's kind of my thought. Using, yeah, using that as a predictor for our future success, obviously, right? Looking at past, past performance. Um, and we have that gift, you know, with, you know, as a global society, we don't want anybody to get harmed or, or killed by this thing, but we definitely can leverage each other's knowledge. Yeah. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us. We're gonna do some questions and answers if that's okay. Yeah, and, sure. Um, a couple of things too, like we're opening up Bridge, like Bridge is our ESS before after school program, June 17th on a smaller scale. I like what we did with the loft, you know, we kind of get people in there and I think your kids even came up to the loft too. Yeah, 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 love um, you. So, our, at Design 39, we're going to be one of the spaces that is going to be opened um, and uh, super unique. So we get that opportunity to make sure we're doing best practice and consulting with you and others. Um, I know we have fabulous doctors in our community. And I know a couple are on this call with us today as well. Uh, Vanessa has a couple comments there. Um, but maybe if parents want to ask, I'll get to these two questions first and then... Uh, this one sounds a little technical, but so looking at 2009 and the issue with the pandemics, I don't know what that means in Europe, uh, increased risk narcolepsy. I don't know. I'm, I'm hacking this thing. Would you still yeah. be confident to get an expedited vaccine? Obviously HCP. So a lot of stuff I don't understand there. So maybe you can digest it for, for us. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'll break that question down, you know, basically just kind of saying are vaccines safe and um, especially when they're rushed to market, right? That's, that's what the question is. And, uh, and so, you know, the answer to that question is, uh, yeah, I will be a little bit nervous getting the first dose of the vaccine. And, um, and I am a little bit nervous when I get the flu vaccine too. Okay. Don't, I'm not an anti-vaxxer, but I, but I'm not somebody who's going to say there's no side effect from, from getting a vaccine. Okay. Uh, 
you are introducing a foreign object into your body. And it's, you know, there's something, something wrong with that. Your body knows it and your body can respond to it in weird ways. Uh, that being said, I choose to vaccinate my kids and I, and, you know, I, I might spread them out. Like, you know, if they, the doc says to me, oh, you could get them all today, or you could get some today and some, you know, next time I'll say, oh yeah, let's spread them out. I like that idea. Um, but, uh, you know, the reality is I see people who don't get the vaccine get completely wrecked. And so I know that the alternative is not good. Right. And I, I can't go through a flu season with my kid at risk. And I know that the vaccine is protective, right? I actually know that because I get to see people who don't get it and get wrecked from it. And, and, uh, and so it's not like you, it's not like it completely protects you, but it certainly helps. And, and I'm, I'm pretty confident I know that as a physician. So my kids get the vaccine um, because for me, it would be unconscionable not to. Uh, that being said, uh, I get patients who got the vaccine and now have like Guillain-Barre, which is a syndrome where you basically get this progressive paralysis and you know, fortunately, if we pick it up, it gets better, but it's like this really scary thing. And I can only, and I can only look and say, the only thing I can think of that caused this was your flu vaccine. And so it's not like it's completely with, without any, uh, you know, risk, but the reality is, uh, it does protect, it's not just herd immunity. You know, there, there's this, this misconception that the vaccine itself is a herd immunity thing. That's the primary benefit from it, but there is actually a personal uh, immunity benefit to it as well. So, you know, there, there's, there's reasons uh, that I would, I would say go with the vaccine. And yeah, will I be a, a little bit nervous the first time around? I will be. Will I get it? Absolutely. And uh, I'll feel better about it a couple of years from now, but I, you know, I get nervous with vaccine. Yeah. Vanessa Park, she's one of our doctors as well. And I, she's also into the space and studies, uh, you know, yeah. UCSF and rounds that they've had, but more tr tr transmission from adult to adult and adult yep. adolescents. Yeah. Maybe yeah. just to clarify that a little bit, you know, yeah, no, totally. So, so not to spend too much time there, but we'll open yeah, that. No, up. Vanessa's point is kids are actually pretty safe. You know, kids are, are, uh, and, and I think we'll get that experience. We'll see people who send their, their, uh, you know, countries that send their kids back to school and they're okay. Um, kids are, are not as, you know, they don't create the viral uh, loads that, that adults do when they get sick and uh, they don't get as sick as they do and they don't transmit it as much. And so if you said to me, group of kids going to school, group of adults hanging out uh, at a bar or restaurant, who's going to get it worse? The answer is the adults for sure. Um, and, and yeah, if, if somebody does a study that uh, says it's totally safe to send the kids out, uh, you know, then I'm totally down with that. Um, that being said, it, I, you know, we can't say that they're not potentially a vector because, you know, they can, they are. Uh, yeah. but, yeah, but it's that viral mind. load yeah that you talked about i think that's really a fascinating point and insight that you've shared with me and i know our listeners just that viral load that that was new learning for me as well yep. all right so we'll open it up uh anyone else has questions we can just unmute your mic uh and uh, we'll go from there Deronda, come on i see you right there center screen anyone have a question or a comment our feedback one here is kids didn't like seatbelts or car seats, but we have them wear, uh, wear seatbelts and car seats. So might as well wear a mask. What do you think about that? Yeah. You know, we were, we've kind of gotten to it. I hate, I put a mask on today when I went in the store, just hate it, but you know, I, I do it anyways. <laughs> Get used. And I wear a seatbelt, by the way, I didn't used to wear a seatbelt. When I was, <laughs> when I was like a teenager, I was not wearing a seatbelt and it took, I, I remember the girlfriend specifically, I was like in college where she just was just like, what, you're like, you're so smart and you're so stupid. And, you know, I, I just kind of, she kind of got me to realize I need to be wearing a seatbelt. But the first, yeah. you know, throughout my younger years, I was like, yeah, I don't need a seatbelt. Yeah. Hey, Liz, what did you share there as a link? Liz Chan, what did you got? Unmute. Oh, hi. Um, I was just trying to look up the book that uh, Dr. I like, I like your about. drink. Your drink is your background here. That's good. <laughs> My new hobby during quarantine. Yeah. So what would you post um, there in the uh, chat box? Oh, it's just the book that um, I'm not sure if it's the book that Dr. Butler was referring to, but it's a coronavirus free book that you can kind of share with your kids. Yep. Yep. Um, so, and, and this is, yeah, just a, a cute little book to talk about washing your hands and, and, uh, and there's, there's a couple out there. This is a great one. Fantastic. So that's there in the chat box. Anyone else? 
I, by the way, I use the kids books as, cause I, I have to send, uh, you know, materials out to doctors. And so I'll, I'll send them like the kid book is like the first link <laughs> and I'll say, read this first and then, and then you can read the rest of the stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hi, this is Nathan. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Butler. Yeah. Um, do you have a recommendation on mask materials? You know, I don't. Is crochet, uh, is crochet a good one? Yeah, it's not crochet. <laughs> not crochet. Okay. Uh, I, you've probably seen, seen memes on the internet of that. Uh, so, I, I'm, I, I don't, and the, and the reason that I don't is that um, I, I've got these paper masks that um, that I have access to, and we haven't really had to go out and use too many too often, and so I just I use those. Um, I, I see a lot of good masks out there and, and much cooler, what look like more comfortable masks. And, but I haven't gone into looking into it just because I happen to have all these other masks and it just hasn't been a topic that I've looked into. But yeah, you were, you were, other people you were mentioning that though, the N93 one you use like with patients, but that idea of just having a regular mouth mask covering in regular public spaces, right? So there's like, yeah, on your, but, your condition that you're in. Yeah, so, so you know, I wear an N95 mask when I uh, take care of patients and sometimes I wear the full body suit, uh, you know, when I have to do uh, procedures that, that are what we consider high risk procedures. So, you know, anything or whatever, but uh, the, um, the, when we're out in public, just that guinea pig story, they were just using the paper surgical masks and uh, you know, that's, that's all that you really need to use. I think to decrease, that's all that I use in public. Hey, yeah, there's Vanessa, some really Dr. Park. Oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Vanessa says, don't use the mask with valves. I, I don't know uh, that, but it makes sense to me. Like I, when I look at them, I'm like, yeah, I don't know about this. That does, to me, that looks like there's a risk of, of having a direct conduit, you know, going the opposite way, but I haven't looked into them. Yeah, Dr. Yeah, Park, you want to add any content? Yeah. yeah, so the, can you hear me? Yeah, go for it. So the mask with valves are, meant to be more for an environmental mask, so to protect the wearer, but they don't actually protect anybody outside of the mask. Yeah. So yeah. they, so any exhaled breath still goes out into the open. So it doesn't necessarily, it's they they were meant for people for like smoke and fires and fumes and things like that. That's a really Thank good you. point. That's a really good point. You're basically just have a direct shot out. <laughs> You're hurting everybody. Yeah. You know, and there is this thing of, of, you know, asymptomatic transmission, right? So, um, you know, none of us know right now that we don't have it or haven't had it. All right. We have time for a few more questions. Anyone else? Yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks a lot, Ian. Uh, my name is Matt Martin. I'm an intensivist at Scripps. Oh, uh, awesome. Which one? Scripps Mercy. Okay. And, uh, spent April in New York City in the COVID ICUs. And and I agree with you 100%. We're not having New York experience and. We can be thankful we're not. Yep. Um, there's been a lot of talk about masks, and and I think something that's been probably underappreciated is the role of of hand hygiene and frequent cleaning of all the areas that people are touching all the time. And, and I can tell you, everybody was wearing masks in the New York ICUs, and then when those studies came out showing the virus particles where they were settling, and they started cleaning everything, that's when we stopped seeing in hospital transmission. Yep. So, so as much or even more important than masks, I think there's a hand hygiene and, you know, washing down of things like computer stations or things where, you know, shared areas where kids or even adults are touching frequently. That, that That's probably, I, I think is even more of a risk for spread. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I'm like, well, you know, I don't really touch my mouth that much, but then you know, I'll eat like a potato chip and realize, wow, I, I literally probably, if I had it on my hands, it just went in my mouth. And, uh, you know, and similarly, there's, there's times where I'll, I'll like, touch my eye or like, we don't realize just how much we, we do touch our face. And uh, when people talk about the mask, you know, protects you because it prevents you from touching your face. Definitely does that. Although from the guinea pig story, we know that it also protects you from inhaling the particle. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, it, it, well, I wash my hands so much more now than I used to. And, uh, and absolutely, if I've been out in public or, you know, around doing something where I potentially could have brought it home. Yeah, and that was yeah. a critical piece for our parents and ensuring that kids are washing their hands and how do they do that appropriately and 
you know, what about the, the hand sanitizer themselves? Because the district's risk management is talking about giving us like five or six of these stations, the hand sanitizer stations inside, outside. Uh, and, you know, we have a few doctors on the call. If anyone could provide content, context for that. Yeah, um, you know, most of these things kill the virus. And, uh, and so, you know, we have them like every six feet in the hospital these days. And uh, just kind of walk by and, and grab a squirt of it and, you know, put it on. I, I uh, not that it, it matters or is important, but I, I don't just do my hands, right? I actually will spread it all the way up my, my, my uh, almost to my elbows. And, and not in like a crazy way, but just kind of, you know, I just kind of make sure that I get up a little bit higher because I know that a lot of times my hands are actually touching not just themselves together, but also these, these parts of my forearm. Thank you. Other thoughts or questions? Questions about riding bikes and getting out in public <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and, and your Jeep. <laughs> yeah, hey, the, the Jeep is where it's at. <laughs> oh man, I've been doing so much, uh, so much fun stuff with that thing. Uh, it's yeah. So we had. Yeah, we had 43 on this call, plus another 35 or so on the YouTube live channel. So almost, you know, good group. So, uh, Adrian, I have a quick question. Uh, what about children becoming asymptomatic carriers of COVID as they are close to each other in uh, a school environment? Um, you know, the concern is as they come home, they spread the virus to parents, grandparents, etc. people that are more uh, susceptible to, you know, uh, the heavier hitting part of the disease. I mean, I think that's a legitimate concern. Uh, you know, I, I think that you know, you can be reassured, you know, that the kids are less likely to get it and less likely to give it. But the reality is um, nobody wants to take a chance, right? And so uh, I completely get that folks who have at-risk populations in their homes are going to isolate themselves differently than people who don't. And I, and I that makes sense. Okay. Question here down at the bottom, Doc, was about uh, the spread of the virus, indoors, outdoors, your patients uh, who probably were asymptomatic, had other pre-existing conditions. Or probably indoors. You also mentioned the Uber driver and probably yeah. some with the viral <laughs> load and all that kind of combined spaces versus being inside, outside. Yeah, yeah. Matt, you're at, you're at Mercy Hillcrest. Is that uh, the one yeah, that you're Mercy at? Hillcrest. Yeah, Mercy, Mercy Chula had a, 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 a Uber driver. He's actually, I, I think he might have been a Lyft driver actually, uh, who got it. And uh, you know, he was like a young guy. And and one of the the docs down there is a good friend of mine. And I just kind of asked him like. You know, the healthy guy and healthy guy is like, yeah, he's a pretty healthy guy. But he was driving a car around and probably had a bunch of people in Chula Vista, right, where they've got more of this disease, unfortunately, and, uh, and you know, had uh, people getting in and out. And so I think he got exposed to that high load. And, uh, and so, again, it's not like young people aren't going to get sick in San Diego. Anymore, and that's a great way to do it. Yeah, so ventilated places. Yeah, man. We should, if you get in, an, in a Lyft or Uber, roll the window down. <laughs> and if you are, uh, if you're hanging out with friends, you know, do it in your backyard. You know, I, I mentioned that I still hang out with friends. I do. Uh, nobody's been in my house, actually. Uh, we actually will go in the backyard, front yard, you know, I say yard, there's no yard, but, you know, like hang out on the steps or whatever <laughs> and uh, and just kind of hang out there and, and talk, you know, or across the fence with my neighbor or something like that. Um, not that it'd be crazy to have somebody in your house, but just, you know, we're in San Diego, we don't need to. And the backyard's a, a great place to be. I think if you said to me, uh, putting the kids back in school, I would say, keep the windows as, as open as possible and let that virus float out into the sunlight and get killed. And so one of the things we chatted about as well was antibody testing and testing itself. And there's actually free testing going on right now. And actually who should be tested uh, specifically with probably folks with pre-existing conditions. Yeah. So maybe you want to talk to us about that and the free testing going on. Yep. So um, as far as the antibody testing goes, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a, a well enough educated opinion to be able to tell you. Uh, and part of that might be because we don't actually know uh, which ones are working that well yet. 
Uh, so I'll just, that one, unfortunately, I, I don't have a recommendation for. Uh, the, the other way that you can get tested is to have a swab put in your nose, right? And they kind of scrape up on the inside part of your, your nose, this place called the cribiform plate. It's incredibly uncomfortable. And, uh, and then they will take that and try to, to see if they can sequence the virus, uh, you know, the DNA, uh, RNA of it. So uh, with that, you know, you can get that test done for free and just call up uh, San Diego, probably go online and figure it out, but uh, San Diego Department of Health and uh, set an appointment and go in there and get tested. Uh, one of my uh, buddies, one of my docs who gets exposed, wanted to go visit his mother-in-law and, uh, and she was recently a patient in the ICU. So she's at risk, she's older, she was sick. And, uh, and so he and his wife got the idea after he worked some shifts, there's a little bit of time off between his shifts, they went and got tested and he didn't go back and get re-exposed to any patients. So, and they kept self-isolated for three days, got back the negative test result and then flew out and visited, you know, her mom. Uh, that to me would be the right time to get tested. So I'm not gonna go in there, spend my day getting my nose scraped when I don't even think I have it. But if I was gonna go out and visit somebody who was at risk um, and I could isolate myself for a few days waiting for that test result, yeah, that's that. Is that foolproof? No. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Like you said, the tests are evolving and getting better as as we speak, and it might be the way that it's swabbed or the location that it's being swabbed. Or yeah, you also have yeah. the secondary tests with the you know you called it a a lung something. So what, there was a yeah. lung flesh. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, sometimes we'll we'll send off tests on people. Uh, literally, we will put a tube all the way inside of their lungs squirt a little bit of saline in, suck it back out, and uh, and send that off for sampling. And that's pretty accurate. Uh, the nose one, we have had patients where their nose was negative, and we were so convinced that they had it uh, that we sent off the sample from their lung and it came back positive. So the nose one is not 100%. Uh, I don't want to give it a number because every hospital's is different and ours is different, and it depends on whether or not the person is willing to really torture you and get a good sample or not. And we're basing their sampling techniques off of other viruses anyways. So who knows if coronavirus really likes the, the cribriform plate or if it would rather be down somewhere else, you know, I don't know. Um, yeah. And there's competing opinions about it, but, uh, but no test is hundred percent. Yeah. One of this, yeah. Uh, one of our viewers wanted to know about um, uh, their younger kid, uh, is six year old, six years old currently had pneumonia with a collapsed lung at three or at risk, you know, as a six year old. Um, yeah, Stay so away from answer, the answer is, uh, probably not, but Matt, you were going to say something about the, uh, about the test. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I was just going to say regarding the antibody test, um, th there's a bunch of them out there. If you're going to get it done, the Abbott ABBOTT test seems to be the most reliable and, it, and it's actually very reliable. I, I think if it's, if it's going to, if that information is going to change anything for you, I think it's a great idea to get that test. Like, like I got it because I'm in contact with coronavirus patients and I actually came back antibody positive, which theoretically, lucky guy. Yeah, theoretically <laughs> means I'm immune. We don't know how long that's, that lasts, but, but I think if that information is going to mean anything to you, and if anything, I think it makes you breathe a little easier if you're positive and it may change your behavior. If you know, you're clearly antibody negative. So, so the antibody test just tells you if, if you're basically immune or theoretically immune. It, so either you had it in the past, had it, or you, you were asymptomatic and might have had it and you developed antibodies. Uh, yep. But if you're going to get the antibody test, I would recommend the Abbott test because there's a bunch of other less reputable ones out there. And I, and I would tell folks, you know, don't change your behavior too much based on that test result because uh, if I can, and this, this reasoning may not be correct, um, but uh, if, if you can say, okay, we give plasma actually to patients that are positive from, from donors that are positive. So we take the antibodies out of people who had it and we give it to people that have it trying to see if there's benefit and there is some benefit, but the benefit is widely variable. And the hypothesis is not everybody's antibodies confer the same amount of immunity. So just because your antibody test came back positive, you were exposed don't you don't know for a fact that you have enough of those antibodies you have enough to make the test positive but maybe not enough to protect you from you know the disease etc so 
you know, it's uh, if you like, like, you know, Matt said, if you've got a reason to do it, then do it. But uh, uh, don't change your behavior based on the result. I think also with the low prevalence of disease in San Diego County, you actually do have a much higher chance of getting a false positive as well. Um, so if somebody has been self-isolating for three months and they think they might've gotten sick back in January and think they might've had it, there's probably a higher chance that it's a false positive if their antibody test comes back positive. Now with Dr. Martin, I would expect that, yeah, he's probably positive because he was exposed. But I think it's, I, I wouldn't do it just because somebody's curious. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, we don't have, uh, of all the tests I was looking today, of all the tests that we've run in Palomar, less than 7% of them are positive. And those are people coming to the hospital thinking they may have it. Those are people who came through the ER. And so if those people are only 7% or less, then you can imagine the general population is less. When they went and tested all of New York, like 30% of people had, had gotten it in some parts and very different uh, prevalence. And so, you know, exactly. Uh, as back to that kid, you know, who had the collapsed lung, uh, I'm not a pediatrician. And so I don't know the answer to that question. My general thought would be um, they, man, probably not at risk, but I'm just ask. I'm not a pediatrician. Uh, you know, my guess is they had a really bad pneumonia and, you know, that was that. Yeah, good, good to just, we don't all know everything, right? And so we put, put yeah. our best heads together. <laughs> I know and, very little, by the way. <laughs> yeah, right. But, we're going to go quote each other and put you on Twitter and call it. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much. Uh, it's about trying to create the best information that we have at this time, yep. our best version. Yep. How do we work smart together? Um, we know that um, we're better when we're learning together and how we can do that and still keep kids safe and our, and our grandparents safe and ourselves safe. So, you know, that's why we're doing these conversations. And um, this is number two. I think there's one more question here and we'll probably close it out with maybe some final comments. At this time, are there any safe ways for children from different households to play together? So, you know, uh, as I mentioned before, I, I do let my kid play with another kid um, and, uh, or another household of kids. So, you know, one of, one of the, the play sets is a, another kid. Another one is, is two brothers that are in the same house, you know? Uh, and, uh, and there's some risk to that, but, uh, but it's low enough that I find it tolerable. And, uh, if you said to me birthday party, I would probably not do a birthday party right now. Uh, but, uh, but you know, is the, is it safe? Sure. I mean, make them wash their hands, wear a mask, stay six feet apart, all that. That's one level of it. Um, there's also slightly less safe ways, which would be limiting the number of kids around. Uh, and uh, or the number of households really that are being exposed or something like that, uh, limiting the things that they're doing, kind of, you know. And so there's a there's uh, high risk stuff, which is playing indoors with a bunch of slobbered on toys, and there's low risk stuff, which is uh, playing outside, exploring the woods together. You know, <laughs> I say that there's rattlesnakes out there, so be careful. But you know, we but the point is, you know, yeah. outdoor play with one other kid, yeah, go for it. I mean, I do. Our custodians would say our kids like to lick windows all over our place, but yeah, I don't think that'll happen anymore. I'm going to be biased. I'm going to uh, let us slip in one more question here um, because it has to do with school. Uh, yeah. You know, air circulation in the classrooms, potential exposure to the virus in the classroom environment is unknown for many reasons, but as a precaution, good ventilation, should we limit the amount of time in classrooms that are closed up and let them ventilate out and then have because we have lots of open spaces right that are not just closed classrooms like you would see in typical school yeah we have collaboration spaces able to spread people out so, so i don't kind of end there and our best guess yeah uh so i don't know what the air circulation system is there and, and how the air gets filtered uh i can tell you that um the in our rooms in the uh in the icu uh, the, the air doesn't change between 30 minutes, right? And so if, if you're all in a room together for 30 minutes, that room is probably going to have the same uh, level of pathogen in it, or probably less if there's circulation running uh, as everyone's kind of settled and sitting down. So I don't know that the time exposed, if it's the same group of people, is going to change too, too much. Um, but that that's literally a question that would have to be answered by uh, some studies about, about yeah. air. 
in, in circulation. Well, you know, the rumor about Design 39 is that we have cucumber water and we also have hospital quality air, just so you know. <laughs> so that's the new rumor. <laughs> so you can get your cucumber water and hospital quality air at Design 39. Come today. <laughs> These days isn't a good thing. <laughs> oh, oh, wait, wait, we don't have that. <laughs> Well, we really appreciate everybody coming on and uh, to our doctors who are in our space, who are willing to share their knowledge and, um, yeah, you know, we're in good, we're in good hands. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks to the other docs. Absolutely. For being here. Yeah. So, and, and All thank right, you. boss. Yeah, All right. Thank you. All right. Bye. Signing off for now. Thanks yeah. everybody. Thank, thank you. you. All right. All right, I stopped three.